We're so excited to be here. I'm Robin Ross, and I'm going to introduce you to everyone. Okay, we've got Wilson Cruz, <laughs> Devin Odessa, <laughs> Beth Armstrong, <laughs> Devin Gomertal, <laughs> Winnie Holdman, <laughs> and Kelsey. Um, you know, so many shows go in and out one season, maybe two, no one talks about them again. Why do you think My So-Called Life has stuck with everyone after all these years? Um, because of the writing, yes. <laughs> Definitely the writing. And uh, I think because, um, you know, we were all a bit fearless to kind of just go for it and, and uh, be really honest and not be afraid to look really dorky, in my case. <laughs> I think because it's it's universal. It's a universal story. I mean, I said this earlier. We could change the clothes, um, <laughs> please, and the hair. Hi, and um, and some of the music, but you know the stories, the the the, the relationships, the the self, the the journey for self identity and. Um, that never changes. That, that happens whether it's 1960 or 2013. And so it lives on because of that, because of its honesty. Like you said, I mean, take the clothes away. I mean, the stories are completely still relevant today. Winnie, how did you create such an authentic teen world? I mean, from the, the use of like in, in writing and, and <laughs> the things that, you know, the issues that they face. Well, first of all, I think, um, thank you all for, for enjoying it. Um, I think you don't, you really don't do something like that all by yourself. Um, even though I wrote it, I had just met these two remarkable guys, Ed Zwick and Marshall Herskovitz, and they, they really, they had inspired me by what they were writing for TV. You know, you really can't separate yourself from all the people you meet along the way who inspire you and also say to you, you know, I think about my writing teachers who said to me, you know, you can do this. I mean, you don't, you don't just sit down and do something by yourself. It's, it really is something where people are all connected. We, we all were operating, you know, kind of as a force field. We were all doing something together. And um, I was inspired by the cast. The cast was getting inspired by what I was writing. But I think just in my, in my personal case, I just want to acknowledge that I couldn't have done anything if people, certain key people hadn't come into my life and said, you can do it, and we want you to do it, and we, we care about what you have to say. And then when it comes down to how did I do that particular script, I remember I really thought to myself, you know, what was it really like and what was going on for me, even though I was a whole generation later, because I don't really believe that people are that different from generation to generation. I believe that people stay that in our hearts and souls people stay the same that that one generation it's just like what wilson was just saying one generation isn't that different from another they're just the tr the outer trappings are different so i just kind of went within and that's what came out wilson i think you played the second gay teen on tv um how was there pressure? Wait, who's the who are you calling? Well, the first the, one? there was the first gay teen Ryan. was Ryan Felipe on date on daytime, right. but I was the first on prime time. Okay. Yeah. So, what was there pressure to be part of? You know, you had such a big role in the in the changing media landscape. Um, I, I wouldn't say there was pressure. I I felt um, I felt a responsibility absolutely, um, but I think one of the things that that really um, allowed me to just be honest and go for it was the fact that we, we did so many of the episodes before they actually aired. So we were doing it for, I was doing it for this audience, right? I, I just wanted to make myself proud and make them proud. Um, there was nothing coming back at all to react to, right? So, um, yeah, the show was made in a lot of privacy. Yeah. So um, the pressure was to be honest and to be um, to tell the story um, did I know it was important at the time absolutely um, did I want to live up to the importance and, and um, do it justice yes and um, I'm proud that there are still young people who are watching it and who are um, receiving the inspiration and hope that that it was meant to give them absolutely uh, Devin Brian was he was a little bit of a dork um, he was? <laughs> hmm. 
And, you know, you were one of the youngest um, on set. Was it awkward for you really living out your, your teen adolescence on, on television? Yes. <laughs> I mean, listen, it's, it's difficult, okay, when you're playing someone that nerdy on TV, you know, you go, you meet a girl, you know, what, what, are, you, what are you supposed to do? Um, you know, and you're like, I swear, I'm, I'm really cool. I'm not like that, you know. At least I have a car in your life. As I don't even like rollerblading. Um, he was, he was, the, he was as, as the mother character, he was my dream for who I wanted her to end up with. I... He wasn't a dork to me. Oh. Nor to me. I mean, and look at what she would have ended up with. <laughs> Holla! Mother is always right. Working out, Brian Cracker. <laughs> no, but, um... It, I don't know what, how to follow that. No, but, um... But it, it was, uh... I, look, I think we all were very brave to just kind of put it out there and, and be, you know, be honest and, and real. Um, you know, it was a little weird because I was um, actually that age and I was, you know, I was 15 and so I, I was saying, I think in some way, like, my adolescence probably was um, a bit delayed by that because, like, my, my adolescence was great. I was, on an, I was on a TV show. It was awesome. <laughs> you know, and then it wasn't until after that where I was kind of like, oh, so, okay, now what do I do, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but it was good and, and I think, um, you know, actually... I remember that Jared was very um, nice about trying to help me uh, meet girls and stuff like that. Some yeah. swagger tips. Yeah, I one, remember that. I remember one time, this is a real, true story, I was driving, I did have a car, which, so, okay, I had a car, yeah, I actually had a really cool car, I had a 69 Camaro, it was awesome, so I wasn't, but you know, it was, an, it was a dork antidote, it was good. Um, no, but I was driving, I'll never forget, and Jared was driving in front of me in his car, and we were going somewhere, I forget, but anyway he stopped and, and like suddenly made this, this erratic right turn and I was like, oh, okay, I thought we were going the other way, but whatever, I'm following him. And then, he, and then I see there's these two girls that were walking on the street, right? And, he see, and they were cute and, you know, whatever. And, and he, he's talking to them for like 30 seconds. That's all it took, okay? And then they come back to me and they go, oh, he said we should give you our phone numbers. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, the parent, the power power of Jared. And, you know, 30 I seconds I've never called long, because I was really? a dork. <laughs> then I put that in the script. That's right, that's right. Yeah, that's um, Winnie and Stephanie, um, music was such a big part of the show. How did you go about making those decisions of, of which songs would be really instrumental and you had Buffalo Tom and, and just music was such a thing? It was... That was, a, that was really a lot written into the script, and uh, Scott Weiner had a lot to do with that music also. He was very involved. My job was to make it, to come in and out of those sequences gracefully. There was a club sequence where I had to be the club band and then turn it into a fight, and you know, I just had to kind of go back 20 years and try to fit these young kids. And it was really fun. It was really inspiring. I'd been working with Ed, Ed Marshall before with Winnie, and, and to be able to to be involved in this show was really, was really wonderful. Can I just say, the, the opening sequence, the music that Snuffy wrote for that opening is so powerful, and I really think that it, it's a huge part of the show. And the, when you, every time you watch an episode, it started with that, and it just, it was so... It's so Yeah, it really, go, it really go. was. Go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bess, a lot of people talked about how the dynamic between your character and Graham was just so true to parents, and a lot of people <laughs> had very similar relationships with their parents as Angela did. Um, what was that like to play her? And were you anything like her? Were you, <laughs> were you a little overbearing or were you more? <laughs> I, I think my, my two sons would say yes. I, that, that I, I had two little boys at home. So I loved coming to work where I had all these girls. You know, it was just so sweet. So I think I was actually um, more uh, overt about being affectionate, physically affectionate with the girls than I ever would have been if I had already experienced teenagers at home. I, I would have been terrified to actually put my arm around them and kiss them and hug them if I had known how hostile teenagers were. <laughs> 
so that created an interesting <laughs> dynamic. And I was saying earlier that, you know, we have these experiences we call lifer experiences where you know, you just get that vibe and know suddenly that somebody's going to walk up to you and say something lovely about the impact the show had on their life. And the, the, the funniest for me is that, that Tom Irwin and I are still very good friends and meet for lunch. And you see a lifer from across the room, see the two of us in a booth, and, and it's like <laughs> their whole reality has just been completely reorganized. <laughs> It's a lot, but but I actually look back on that show and think, I, I, you don't see many shows, I don't think nowadays, where the parents are given, the adults are giving given equal weight to the kids, and I think that was one of the things that I hear over the years. Uh, that people of all ages still find so powerful that the stories, I mean, you know, Claire has a zit, I find my first wrinkle. That, that episode, I mean, that was just a wonderful thing of, you know, the two of them going through that, that crisis, right. of, that vanity crisis, and, and the kids were discussing Kafka, metamorphosis in school in the same I episode. Love, I love when people have wa- watch, were fans of the show as kids, you know, as teenagers, and now they come up to me and go, I have to tell you, I watch the show now, and I'm enthralled with the story, the, the parent storyline. Like, now they're, yeah, yeah, they're like, they're like, oh, she wasn't such a bitch. She was, <laughs> she was like a freaking mom, like. But, and then that's another thing that I get. I got, I faced off with two kids at, at a party recently where one of them said, oh my gosh, you were the mom I always wished I had, and the other one is going, are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, and they were arguing between well, themselves. Well, it's in the eye of about, the beholder. Yeah, but, that, but again, that's a tribute to the power of the writing that, that kids to, today can be saying, or you know, who have grown up watching the show can suddenly be seeing the truth in the adult story. You know, your, your ability to write our voices was just as powerful as with the kids. This girl came up to me and she was like, I grew up. I thought I was Angela when I was a kid, and I grew up to become Patty. <laughs> um, we're going to take some audience questions. Thank you very much. I was just going to ask, Wendy, when you put that in about the year 2000, was that very intriguing? And what were you thinking about the year 2000? I was trying to think of a bad idea for a yearbook. <laughs> And I think I did, I did pretty well with that. <laughs> I mean, I would think back to my yearbook, you know, what, I was on yearbook briefly, and I would, our, we had themes, you know, and our theme was apple fruit of knowledge, which I think I put in the pilot. <laughs> Isn't that, wasn't that one of the moments? And <laughs> I just thought it was bad, and I still think it's bad. <laughs> Do we have another audience question? Um, where do you guys picture the characters now? Like, where would they be? What would they be like? What would they yeah. be like? Yeah. Well, I, I think that um, Brian Krakow definitely invented something very lucrative for the internet. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, something, a little something called Facebook, something like that, perhaps. <laughs> No, I think he would have. Actually, I think that probably was Krakow's idea. It just wasn't, it hadn't quite gone to the front of his brain yet because the hair got in the way. <laughs> no, that totally makes sense. Else? I think we're all deferring, we're all looking to win it. Well, she won't tell us, but we, we answered like to, it earlier. I don't like to really say that. Oh, I, I think uh, Ricky Vasquez got the hell out of there as soon as he could, which was right, right around 17, 18, and went to New York and became um, a very successful fashion designer. And he give, he, you, know, you can go to Paris and see his shows, and Angela and Sharon and Brian and Jordan all come. Where's Sharon? So do you think Angela um, grew up to join the CIA? Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps. <laughs> that was so in my mind. <laughs> Where's Sharon Chersky? Um, we talked about this, we answered this question earlier, and before I, before I got my so-called life, I always played the bad girl, always. Um, and, you know, I just had a single mom growing up, and I mean, it was, you know, I just always played the bad girl. And so it was a new thing for me to play this sweet, good girl, you know? So, but it's kind of ironic, because even though I grew up in a kind of weird way with a very crazy mom, who's still crazy, but I love her, who, you know, got pregnant when she was 17, you know, just doing this all over the place. Um, 
even, you know, I'm married and I have a beautiful daughter and I feel like Sharon probably, I feel like maybe I turned into more of Sharon than maybe the other characters I played before that. You well, know? I think that's who you always were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. So that's, that's where Sharon should be. She'd be right here, right <laughs> now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, I have to wrap out with one final question. Would we have ever gotten to meet Tino? <laughs> Theory's gone on. There's no way. <laughs> Could he be anything better than what you think he is in your head? <laughs> that, that would never happen. No, that would never happen. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for being here, and, and thanks to all of you guys. I think everyone looks back at myself a lot.